It's good to be back. Uh, went uh, to visit my daughter and her husband. They moved to Florida, and we kind of helped them move and get them settled and got to spend a little bit of time relaxing and also moving couches and stuff. So, um, but uh, we, we, we actually had a good time, and it, it was, but it's great to be back and be sharing with you this morning. And we are jumping back into our marriage series. We have this week and next week. We'll be closing the series out next week. Um, And uh, today we're talking about the godly role of a wife. So if you remember a few weeks back, we talked about the godly role of a husband. And so today we're talking about the godly role of a wife. Um, So our key passage, the verses that we're going to be focusing on, are Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. Um, But I would encourage, we're also going to be referring to that whole passage that Paul talks about uh, marriage throughout the different, throughout the uh, sermon. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Ephesians 5, verse 22 through 24, and let's jump in. It says this, wives. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, I am not naive. I understand that many of you all sort have all sorts of reactions and presuppositions when you see this title or you read this text. I, this is a tough one. This is a, a very tough one for a lot of people. But I'm going to say this. A few weeks ago, we talked about the husband's role, and I got some great feedback on that, both from wives and husbands. I had husbands that say came to me and said, man, it was just a re- great reminder of the sacrificial love I'm supposed to have for my wife to lift her up, uh, you know, to kind of get myself on focus of what my, what a marriage is about. Um, and I had wives, you know, thanking me for, you know, sharing with their husbands and reminding their husbands and saying, you know, hey, I, I, my husband needs that burst. So I'm just going to ask you, uh, ladies, especially those that liked the sermon for the husbands, you know, be open for this one, okay? Um, uh, men... Uh, I'm going to be addressing wives. We all know how well that goes oftentimes. So I just ask you to be praying for me. Uh, um, you know, there's a reason I didn't have Bruce preach within the series. Because literally it was this week, and I'm like, I'm not going to make the guy his first week preach this sermon. And then next week we're going to be talking about sex. And I'm like, those are not probably his first two sermons. Those just don't seem like it'd be the best thing to do. Um, so I do want to just let you know, I, ha- I let Tanya and, and my daughters all go through my, um, this, my notes. And I told them, I said, hey, you go through and you just cut out anything that you think is going to be hard to hear. Okay? So I let them do that. So in conclusion, <laughs> right? So ladies, I get it. Some of this is going to be hard to hear, okay? Um, but but uh, I, I, I'm hoping that we can all be, be very open and trust that what I'm going to do my best to do is to just present what God's word says, okay? I'm going to do my best to present what God's word says. See, that this concept of husbands love your wives, it doesn't sound as hard, does it? Right? That sounds, well, well of course he's supposed to love me. But you see, you got to add the, the description of that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That is a very difficult role, a very difficult thing to, to measure up to. And so, so both of these roles are, are hard. But this word submit, it comes with a lot of baggage attached to it, right? And the reason it comes with this baggage attached to it is because of sin, abuse, and our culture. And, but I want to touch on the, the, the sin and the abuse part real quick. Ladies, I just want to let you know that submitting in abuse is not something that you need to do. And if you're in an abusive situation, you need to get help in that case. Okay? And I want to encourage you, implore you, to not leave here today without coming and talking to one of our prayer partners, myself, or any one of our other leaders so that we can work with you to get the help that you need if you are in an abusive situation. OK? 
okay? This, the, the principles I'm talking about, if you're in an abusive situation, it, it's, it's definitely going to, to hurt because you're in a situation that you're not meant to be in, okay? So I want to start with that caveat. <clears throat> However, the Bible actually treats submission as a wonderful word. In fact, I would say this, that submission stands as one of the keystones of the Christian life. Let me say it again. Submission stands as one of the keystones of the Christian life. You see, we're all called to submit. Every single one of us is called to submit. It starts with a submission, submitting ourselves to God and his word. And saying, God, what your word says, I want to live by that. And so I would ask that if you're, if you're someone who bristles a little bit at this word or you struggle with this word, that you would prayerfully ask God to open your heart and to be receptive to it. Be open to the idea that God knows us and he has reasons for the ways he wants us to function. Now, before we dig into this, what it means too much, what I, what I want to do is um, I want to see that while people have, I want us to show that while people have manipulated this word to be abusive and that, that the Bible, the Bible actually shows that while God does establish an order and structure to all relationships, he does place a high value on women and loves men and women equally, okay? So you got to remember, when the Bible was written, this this passage of scripture, the entire passage of Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, it was cult, countercultural at the time it was written. Why? Because it was written into societies that didn't value women in any way. In fact, through most of the Old Testament, women were, were con- completely considered property. They're, through The cultures that the Old Testament was written in, was, the, those cultures considered women as property. They, they had no rights at all. And the Bible, all through the Old Testament, we see God uses women. He, he lifts them up. He raises them. He gives them a, a place of honor. But during the Greco-Roman era the, in which that Paul wrote this passage 2,000 years ago, when he wrote this passage, women still had no public role. Women were still very much considered possessions more than they were partners. Women could not have citizenship. Men had the right to sell their wives as slaves or have them executed. There was a Roman statesman, Cicero, that stated that women's intellect was so low that they should have guardians to take care of them. Often, women were not given real names. More often than not, in the Greco-Roman culture, when a woman... When a, when a girl was born, the first girl, born girl would be given the feminine version of her father's name. So, for instance, if her name was, if his name was Julius, like Julius Caesar, she would be named Julia. But then the second, her name would be, the, the second born daughter, her name would be Secunda, which simply means second. And the third daughter would be named Tishira, which means third, and so on and so on. So they, she never even had an actual name. Women were never asked if they loved the man that they were given in marriage to or even if they wanted to be married. Now, that was the Greco-Roman culture. What about the Jewish culture? Right? Paul was a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. Uh, well, the Jewish culture had a much higher ideal of marriage and women, but it was still very low. The, the, the culture still didn't really buy in to what God would, was calling them to. In fact, many men, many Jewish men had a prayer in the mornings. And part of, that, part of that prayer was this. Thank you, God, for not making me a slave, a Gentile, or a woman. Right? Thanks, God, for not making me into a girl. Right? Um, men, men, men could give a certificate to, of divorce to their wives for any reason at all. And she was out. A woman could only divorce her husband if he was a leper or an apostate. But we see that in the midst of this world, in the midst of that kind of society, Jesus and the letters of the New Testament brought great value to women. And it didn't care what the culture taught, 
But instead, in the midst of that culture that had no value for women, Jesus and the disciples taught and practiced God's view of women and marriage. See, so what we're reading today, it was countercultural at that time. Because it was countercultural to say that a husband should love his wife, let alone love her in a sacrificial way, the way Christ loved the church. So it was countercultural, just in a different way. We see that women were clearly used in the gospel story against what the culture would have wanted. We see that women were among the last to leave the cross. We see that women were the first to, see, to come to the empty tomb. They were the first to uh, be eyewitnesses to the resurrection. We see that Jesus had multiple public interactions with women uh, and even defending the adulterous woman against her male accusers, which was unheard of in that culture. Now, all those things, they don't seem like a big deal to us, but I promise any one of these things would have graded people the wrong way in that, in that first century. They didn't like it. They didn't like that, that women were given a place of honor in the scripture because it didn't make sense to their culture that told them the way things are supposed to be. We see in the letter of Acts um, to the churches that we see that women were given high places of honor there and high places of value. There was actually a woman mentioned who was a deacon in the church. There's a woman who was a prophet and when Peter and Paul, in their different letters, tell husbands that they are to love and to value their wives, that was a countercultural statement, especially the way Paul describes this love. Let me just read 25 through 33 again and remind, be reminded. It's this culture that I just described in which Paul writes this, this culture that says women are possessions, women have no rights, they can't be citizens, they, 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 they aren't to really be valued. It's in that culture that Paul writes this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You see, husbands aren't just told to love their wives, but they're told to love them in a very sacrificial way. What does he say? He says that they're to, he's to give himself up for her. He's to love her as his own body. He's to love her as himself. And then ultimately, he's to love her as Christ loves the church. You see, that was a very countercultural way of seeing things. Now, there were many husbands who were fond of, had fond feelings for their wives, I'm sure. There were probably many good natured men who still cared for them. But to actually love her the way he loved himself, to actually sacrifice himself for her. The idea that he would love her the way Christ set the example of loving the church, that was extreme. And that was in the face of culture. And I bring all that up to say that today we face a different cultural backlash. See, even though the Bible and Paul in no way degrade women, our culture pushes against it and reacts negatively to the fact that God does give a plan for marriage. See, we're fine with the idea that husbands are called to lovingly sacrifice for the, their wife. But we don't want to accept the fact that, that wives are called to submit to their husbands. 
just as an example, many of you heard the speech by Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker two weeks ago. If you haven't heard it, I encourage you to, to look it up to see what I'm talking about. She, Harrison Butker is the kicker for the Chiefs, and he gave the commencement address at a Catholic college. So he's within his tribe, right? People that all have the same beliefs. In that commencement address for two minutes at, verse, at number minute 12 through 14, if you're interested, for two minutes, he basically tells the ladies there that, hey, you might pursue a career, but you might choose to be a homemaker and support your husband that way and, and take care of your, your children. And that, that is a viable option for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. That should be applauded if you choose to do that. Didn't say they had to do it. Didn't say they were lesser than. Didn't say that they were, it was dumb for them to get a degree. Didn't say anything degrading. He simply said that. And it has been all over the news for two weeks. Why? Because our culture hates the idea that God has established some things that might be better for us. And that doesn't mean that it, it, a, wife can't, a wife shouldn't work outside the home. doesn't mean she shouldn't have a career. He's not, he wasn't saying anything about that. He was saying that you might choose to do this. And if you do, you should be applauded for that. You shouldn't be put down because you don't have a career outside the home. And yet, the media gets a hold of it and tears him apart. So if that's the way they react to that, how does our culture react to the simple idea that God has an order of the marriage of men having the burden of leading the home and sacrificing for his wife and wife taking the role of a, as a submissive partner how do they react to that? In my, from what I've seen, they oftentimes in many circles see it as outright abuse. So this morning, the question that this comes down to, I think, for us is not how do you feel about it, not how do you feel about this role, but rather what role and what authority do you give to Scripture in your life? What role and authority are we going to give to Scripture in our life? Because it doesn't matter what our culture says. See, the culture was pushing against the men back then and saying, hey, that, this is not okay the way you're doing it. You, you need to do this. And now we live in a different culture. And yes, did it, does the culture, there, is there some things about the culture that needed to swing because there was so much abuse and things going on? Absolutely. But if we're going to let what God's Word says make us angry at him or rebel against him because of our feelings and the way the culture is, I would suggest that we really need to examine what kind of role and authority we're giving his word in our life. So with that, I want to give three biblical keys or three keys to biblical submission in marriage. Three keys. The first is I believe it's personal. It's personal submission. Notice what it says. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Ladies, that does not mean you need to submit to other men. That doesn't mean that some other man tells you to do something and you need to say yes. That doesn't mean that you can't have authority over other men. Okay, that, that's in no way saying that. You may have men at work that you have authority over. Um, you, you might have sons right now that are gonna grow up to be men and you don't have to listen to them. You, they have no authority over you. Um, you have no submission, you don't have to submit to them. Um, if you're an adult lady right now, even who's not married, and when I'm being adult, I mean not age, you're like self-sufficient, you're not relying on your parents. If you don't have to submit to your parents, you, you need to submit to your own husbands. That's what that, that is saying. Now, here's some other things that it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, just because you're submitting to your own husband, it doesn't mean you have to submit to your husband in everything. Now, some of you men right now are going, wait a second. It just said everything. Yeah, everything that is in, is in line with the Lord. 
Everything that is in line with the Lord. If your husband is asking you to do something that would lead you away from Christ, that encourages you not to read the word or have fellowship or do something that you can see from scripture is not right, you're not called, you're not called to submit to that. I like John Piper uh, writes this. I love what he says. I, I think I have a slide for it. it. says this. The husband does not replace Christ as the woman's supreme authority. She must not follow the husband's leadership into sin. But even where a Christian wife might have to stand with Christ against the sinful will of her husband, she can still have a spirit of submission. She can show by her attitude and behavior that she does not like resisting his will and that she longs for him to forsake sin and lead in righteousness so her her disposition to honor him as head can again produce harmony. See, 1 Peter says it this way in chapter 3. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some of them don't, some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And what he's simply saying is, right, when we live out our role, when a husband loves his wife and sacrifices for her, if she's not a believer, guess what? That might draw her in line, draw her to Christ, right? That might draw her to a point where she goes, wow, I should check this out because this is pretty amazing, the difference it's making in you, right? If, if a wife learns to respect her husband and, 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 and can put herself in a submission to him and, and, and follow him, guess what? That's probably going to make a husband go, I should check this Jesus guy out because I, I really like the way, the difference it's making in my relationship. So it's personal, but it's also practical. It's practical. It's a practical role. See, it's not suggesting that a husband is better than a wife, but rather that we have different roles. The husband has the role to be responsible to make sacrifices for his wife and family as Christ does the church, and the wife has the role to submit out of reverence for Christ. See, we're all in submission, submissive relationships. I, I mentioned that, but, but think about this. Every single person that's ever walked this earth lives in submissive relationships. Even Jesus himself submitted Jesus submitted to his parents. We don't ever read that Jesus was like, hey, mom, dad, I don't know if you realize this, but I'm God. And so, you know, I've kind of got it figured out. You guys really don't know what the heck's happening. You know, I know that you've heard other teenagers talk like this, but, um, but G- we don't ever, we, we never hear Jesus do this. And Jesus, be, be, Jesus submitted to his own parents. He also submitted to his heavenly father. Even though he was equal to his heavenly father, who was no way lesser than, but he submitted to him. John 8, 29 says this, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus, in some ways, submitted to others, submitted to us by giving of himself. Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We see throughout the Bible that we, as as Christ followers, we are called to submit to the governing authorities. Romans 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Does that mean that God loves our leaders more than he loves us? Does that mean that they're they're, they're better than us? Does that mean that we're not equal to them? No, in no way, it doesn't mean any of that. It simply means there's a practical aspect to the relationship because God knows how things function better. Hebrews 13, seven, we're called to submit as Christ followers to our, our spiritual leaders. Hebrews 13, seven says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have, an account, have to give an account. So let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Does that mean that church leaders have a, better, have a more special place in God's eyes? Nope. Does that mean that they're better than anyone else? Nope. Does that mean that God doesn't love us equally? Nope. It just means God knows that in relationships, there is, it functions best within an order. Children are called to submit to their parents in Ephesians 6.1. Does that mean that God doesn't love children as much? Nope. Does it mean that their, their adults are better than them? No. It simply means 
that there's a practical order to relationships. See, no one can fulfill God's call in our life without being willing to be submissive. It starts with our submission to him and then saying, God, what do you call me to? And we practice submission to others in order, in the order that God establishes relationships. We submit to others in the order that God establishes relationships. Third and final one I'll hit today is purpose. Submission has a purpose. The word submission is hupatasso. It's a military term that means to arrange under, to arrange under. So ladies, I'd like you, I'm wondering if it would help to think of it this way. The word sub, the word sub means under, right? Mission, right? We know what a mission is. It's a purpose. It's a calling. It's, it's what, what we're doing, right, with the direction we're heading. God calls you in your, within your role as a wife to live under your husband's mission. What is your husband's mission? To love you as Christ loves the church, See, his, his calling, his highest calling is to love you and sacrifice for you as Christ loves the church. And so when you submit in that, that role, you're making his mission easier for him. You're making it easier for him to love you and sacrifice for you the way Christ loves the church. But when you pull against that, that makes this role harder. And guess what? The same rebellion you have he has. And then instead of us functioning and going the same direction, we start doing this. See, our whole role, both of us husbands, your role is to love your wife so well, to sacrifice for her so well that it's just it's like, yeah, I'll submit to that. That's easy. I'd love to submit to that. Right? And, and wives, your role is to, to lift your husband up and, and respect him and listen to him, even when you don't want to sometimes. As it, so to him to say, man, this is, this, this is such an awesome joy. I want, to, I want to do everything I can to lift her up. And see, God knows that when we work like that, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Now, there are times when this hupatoso, when that word is used to mean to compel someone to submit, like to make them submit. But more often than not, in the 28 times it's used, more often than not, it's used to mean a voluntarily choosing to submit to the higher authority. And that's how Paul uses it here. It's voluntarily choosing to submit. Husbands, notice nowhere in the description of what you are called to do does it say, husbands, see to it that your wives submit. Doesn't say that anywhere. Husbands, your role is not to tell your wife that she needs to submit. Your role is not to make her feel lesser than or worse about herself or bad about herself because she struggles with submission. Your role is to love her as Christ loves the church and you let her and Jesus work out her part. Right? That, that's what we're called to do. Nowhere does it say we tell each other what to do here. Instead, what we should be seeing as husband and wife is that we both have very difficult callings. And as partners, we should be doing all that we can to make it as easy as possible for the other to fulfill their role. Submission is not about the superiority of a man, but it's about the functionality of the marriage. Let me give you a key verse that I hope will kind of make this make, this make sense. 1 Corinthians 11.3. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says this. It says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. We'll walk through this for a second, right? What's that saying? It's saying that Jesus is the head of every man, and that the husband is the head of every wife. But then God is the head of Christ. So what is that saying? If that's saying that God, the Father, God the Father has authority over God the Son, even though they are equals. They are equals, but God the Father has authority over Christ the Son. Is Christ any less God? No. Is he any less important? No. 
but he chooses to relinquish his rights to the other for the order of the relationship. See, Jesus said this in John 6, 38. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You see, we see that the purpose is to promote the will of the Father and to be an example of Christ and the church. Ladies, submission in a godly home is not meant to be something that you are fearful of because it should be coupled with a husband who is seeking to love sacrificially as Christ loved the church. But I'll say this. Sometimes it will take you submitting first in order to draw him closer. Sometimes you need to take the higher ground by humbling yourself in order to break through his pride. But just as your husband is not called to make you submit, you are not called to make him lead. See, what is beautiful, though, is if both parties are seeking Christ, And both begin to live out the roles out of reverence for Christ in a symbiotic way. Husbands, if you lead your wives in a domineering and self-serving way, first of all, if you've been through this series and that's how you're doing it and you you lead this series in any way thinking that that's biblical, get your ears checked. Okay, you've missed every point of this entire series. But if you're leading your wife in a domineering way, You are completely missing what Jesus did for the church. But wives, if you refuse to submit to your husband, you're hiding how the church should respond to Jesus. See, the purpose of submission is to give your husbands the opportunity to be all that God calls them to be, just as him lifting you up and sacrificing for you is to give you the opportunity to be all that God calls you to be. But he needs to be given the opportunity to lead and to grow into the man that God wants him to be. He's got to be given that opportunity. See, I, I've come into contact a lot over the years with a lot of women who say they want their husbands to lead, but then they fight them every step of the way. Right? It's, it's, it's like they, they're like, lead, lead, get back here. Lead, lead. You're not leading how I want you to. Lead, lead. I, okay, listen, here's how you need to lead me, right? It, it, we, we, it's like lead, but guess what? When you have to tell someone and when you're constantly telling them how they need to do it, that's not letting them lead. That's you leading them and telling them what they need to do to make you happy. There are times that a husband is not a good leader because a wife is not a good follower. I, I think there are a lot of women that they might not literally say these words, but they think at least, if he would just do what I tell him to do, he'd be a great leader. So ladies, here, here's something that you, you can take home, hopefully. See, sometimes a wife gets the best husband. Sometimes the wife has the best husband. That happens every now and then. But more often than not, She needs to make the best of the husband she has. She needs to accept. I don't know if you guys, all you ladies are aware of this, but Jesus came and left. There's no, none of us are Jesus. No man is Jesus. He's not going to be perfect. He's broken. He's flawed. He has all sorts of issues. And sometimes you, you, you have to make the best of learning to follow the leader you chose to marry and letting him lead. The second purpose is this. It points to Jesus. So there's two purposes. It, the second is that it points to Jesus. See, verse 32 says, the mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. See, marriage is modeled after redemption, and it points to redemption. Jesus' sacrificial love is a model for husbands, and the church submitting to Christ is a model to wives. And when a body doesn't submit to a head... Or a head doesn't lead the body. What do we call that? Think about a physical body. If the body 
will not function the way the head wants it to, or the head doesn't lead the body, what do we call that? We call that either diseased, right, or, or dis uh, disabled, right? It's, it's not right. Something's not functioning ex like the way it's meant to function. When we're living out our roles, both in the church and in the marriage, we make Christ look good. But when we're not, we make Christ look bad. And I guess I'll close with this question. Would you say your marriage makes Christ look good? Would you say your marriage makes Christ look good? And if not, don't write a list of the things that your partner is doing that's messing that up, but think through how could I contribute to making my marriage represent Christ in a good way. See, when you submit to your husband, even in his flaws, you're being faithful in your trust of the Lord. You're saying, God, I struggle with his weaknesses. I see the cracks and I see the sin, but I trust you. And I'm gonna trust him into your hands. And I'm gonna trust that you have me and you have him in the midst of the most difficult times. Can I just close and pray for marriages? Let's pray. Father God, you call us to this life that is tough. And, and mo most of us enter into the marriage relationship. And, and when we enter into a marriage relationship, we so often have different ideas about what it's gonna be than what it ends up being. And yet, God, what you created is, is beautiful if we let it be beautiful. It's difficult and it's painful, but beauty comes out of that. So God, I just pray for all the marriages here. I know that so many marriages are struggling. There's so many things built up against our marriages. So many messages that tell us it's not worth it, to tell us to go do our own thing, to tell us it's old fashioned, it's, it's, not, it's not viable in our culture. And yet God, I've seen it. I've seen and witnessed the miracle of of people learning to, to, to sacrifice and submit and, and to, to love as you call us to love and the, the power that comes out of a marriage like that. God, I just pray your grace over the marriages in this church. I pray your, that you just pour your loving kindness out on them. God, I pray for those who are not yet married who but are getting ready to enter into a relationship like that, I pray that you just watch over them. You, you open their eyes to, to the lies that this world tells them and, and, and prepare them for what it means to live in the marriage relationship, honoring you. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.